I am Lametria, also known as Mimi with Clarity Fitness. We are bringing you another edition of our webinars. So what is this webinar about today, guys? It's about intuitive eating. Something that we all could use some more knowledge on, gain some great information on it, and then use it from this point forward. So if you guys have any questions or concerns, please, please, please go ahead and put them in the chat box. Myself or Malak will go ahead and answer those questions. If at any time while she's talking, you can go ahead and, you know, put your question in there or your concern and we will answer it for you. Don't wait till the end. We do have a Q&A section at the end, but stop us in that moment so we can go ahead and make sure we get those questions answered. And with no further ado, I want to go ahead and let you guys know we have Miss Malak on here who is going to give her expertise, her knowledge, and all the good stuff on intuitive eating. Malak, take it away. Awesome. Thank you guys so much for having me. I am really, really, really excited to be here. I was telling Mimi, I'm a little bit nervous. I haven't done a webinar like this um, this year yet. So, um, I think it's helpful for me to speak that anxiety or that nervousness out. <laughs> but I am really excited to be here to share with you guys some information regarding intuitive eating and diet culture um, and helping us kind of identify where diet culture may come in and how we can use intuitive eating principles to help maybe challenge some of those um, trends or thoughts that we may see. So um, before I continue, I wanted just to say like a little bit about me and how I got here. I always feel like when I go to presentations or webinars, I'm always like, well, who is this person speaking? Um, but I am originally, I was born in Toronto and uh, came, uh, we traveled overseas a bit before coming back to the Michigan, Ohio area where my family still um, resides. And I traveled a bit throughout the different states before landing here in Dallas, Texas. Um, where I opened up my own private practice um, and do amazing things like this. Uh, for those of you who may know me, know how much I love to talk and love to talk about intuitive eating and diet culture. So, and just sharing what I know and how it's been helpful for um, some. Uh, and hopefully, my hope is that what you guys get from this, maybe it's some information that you have known and just kind of forgot about. About. Maybe you learn something new and maybe some applications and ways that you can incorporate it into your life. So what I want to do is I'm going to try to share my screen. Um, oh, can I, how do I share my screen with the PowerPoint? I think maybe if I can have access to it. Okay. Um, but I'll, how about, I'll just, I'll keep talking about the rest of um, what, what we'll be doing. Uh, so along with all of that, I have been working in, um, as a dietitian for the last 10 years and specializing in eating disorders for the last seven. Um, I think I'm coming up actually even on my 11th year. Goodness, time, time goes by. Um, but I absolutely love what I do. I love being a dietitian um, and uh, getting to talk about food, nutrition, and, and all those things. So um, how many of you, maybe, I don't know if I can do it in a, uh, if you guys could raise your hands or, but how many of you maybe think that like, well, why do I need to know this information? I don't diet. It's maybe not relevant to me. Um, and maybe aren't sure of like what intuitive eating um, is. So before we kind of get started, I did want to uh, break down a little bit of the eating styles that we might, we might see. Um, because like I said, I, sometimes we're like, but I'm okay. And it's not a big deal. And um, I'm not dieting. I've never been on a diet how would intuitive eating work for me? So what I would kind of encourage you to kind of think of is we're going to break up the different eating styles into three kind of categories. And those categories are going to be, um, let me see. So it's going to be an unconscious eater, uh, a clean, a careful clean eater or a professional dieter. So the reason why I'm bringing this together is awesome. Let me see if I can share my screen now. 
cool. Let's see. From the beginning. Yay. OK, so this is what the first, second slide, third slide. All right, this is where we're at. So um, these are the three different kinds, three different types of eating styles. Again, the reason why it's important to kind of identify where we may fall into the categories is it helps gives us a little bit more information as to in, um, maybe where our thoughts or where diet culture has, has come into play. Um, diet culture is defined as a system of beliefs uh, or worship of thinness, which equates to health. Um, and it promotes weight loss as a mean of a higher status. So basically that diet culture trends might come in, come into play and try to convince us to come in and buy a, maybe a product or sell us something that uh, shrinks us or makes us smaller or less than and makes us feel really guilty for engaging in those behaviors. Let's kind of jump into an unconscious eater. So maybe some of us and I will totally own up that I, this is totally me, especially the emotional part. Um, chaotic, maybe if I'm a chaotic unconscious eater, I'm definitely multitasking. I'm trying to get my dog out the door with a cup of coffee and a bagel and going to my office. So I'm doing a lot of different things and not focusing necessarily on the food and noticing my hunger and fullness cues. Maybe a refuse not eater would be like, let's say we have a candy jar um, in the office and we feel like we have to constantly maybe grab, um, grab at it. Waste not would be somebody that, or some behaviors that would, like if we go to a restaurant, we feel like we have to eat everything because we were paying for it and we don't wanna waste the money that we paid for. An emotional, um, especially given everything that's going on right now in the world, the, our stress levels are really, really high. Our bodies are going through um, a traumatic and stressful experience with the virus, our schedule, um, and just everything else that's, that is, has been created. Um, and so we would, so using food to cope with those emotions. So the one thing I do find that's interesting is something that you guys can maybe notice and pay attention to is that sometimes with emotional eating, we might go to specific foods when we're feeling a certain emotion. And sometimes it's hard to identify those emotions, but it's really easy to go to a certain food. So sometimes like if let's say I'm feeling sad or stressed out, I might go to something cold um, and refreshing. So either like ice cream or Italian ice or chocolate, something like that. Whereas if I'm feeling angry or frustrated, I would go to maybe something like salty, crunchy, um, like chips or um, crackers, things like that. So just something for you guys to kind of note and maybe notice, like, do I, do I use certain foods for certain emotions? Because sometimes what's helpful is if we can identify the food that we go to, then um, we can, if we identify the food that we go to, then we can maybe underline or find out what that emotion is underneath. So, so that would be an unconscious eater, a professional dieter. I feel like uh, growing up, I've like, always have that they're always constantly on a diet somebody who is trying the next latest thing um, and my goal here is that to try to kind of maybe a little convince you that how diets definitely do not work and how intuitive eating is such an amazing um, it's something that we're all born with and how we can kind of go back to it so the last supper eating will be like how many of you guys know people that are or even ourselves that it's like sunday i'm gonna eat whatever i want but monday i'm gonna get back on that diet and once i get back on that diet i will you know regain control and 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 feel better but it's this constant cycle of the last supper um aspect the careful clean eating could be um, maybe we're really focused on ingredients organic health foods were very rigid um, and we create kind of days where we can cheat on our diets. Um, and again, all of these, these different eating styles can help us kind of see like, all right, maybe this is an area of where I need to do a little bit more work on. The thing I love about, I mean, I love a lot of things about intuitive eating, but you can really start off with any of the principles. Um, so let me, kind of jump in here and talk a little bit about what intuitive eating is. Um, so intuitive eating is, um, 
the way I like to kind of describe it is I believe that we were all born as intuitive eaters. As babies and children, we eat when we're hungry, we stop when we're full, we play, we have fun, we aren't worried about our body or the way that we look, and there's a sense of like freedom. And so we grow up and diet culture starts to come in and it gets a little bit staticky and, and messy. And it's like, well, what should I believe? Should I believe like the things that I was born with, with these cues, or should I believe a culture and society that's telling me that, um, how I can, how I can change my body, which would amplify my worth, which is completely not true. So the 10 principles of intuitive eating are up here. What I would like, or what I'll be doing today is going through each of the principles, along with maybe some diet culture trends and um, that you've heard of and see how we can use the principle in challenging what diet culture has maybe what, has, what diet culture has told us to believe. There is no maybe, it's definitely what it's told us to believe. Um, if you are interested in learning a little bit more, um, there's an intuitive eating book, I actually have it here with me, um, and they just came out with the fourth edition. It is, oh my God, if I can fangirl over two people, it'd be over, um, it would be over intuitive eating and the authors. So I absolutely uh, love it. And uh, I think I've read it probably over 15 times and I literally learn something new every time and the new edition is just phenomenal so uh, check it out if you want to know more and they even have a workbook too so again kind of what I had mentioned earlier and that um, is diet culture kind of comes in and and gives certain people elevates certain people and then decreases and minimizes others so and when i say that i'm i am referencing in regards to weight um i will throughout the presentation say fat because i do think it's important that we uh are able to say it and not and not make it feel like it's something derogatory or wrong or bad that it is okay to say i am fat and that's okay it doesn't have to judge it does not judge my worth or who i am so Diet culture is going to come in and tell us, you know, you can't have sugar, you need to do cleanses, um, keto is amazing, uh, eggs are bad, meat is not good, granola has too much sugar, don't eat candy, don't do this, and so black and white, um, I kind of joke around, but I always feel like the only place that a villain has is in Disney movies, it has no room <laughs> in my food, to judge my food, or to make any sort of comments um, about my food choices. So let's leave the, the villains to, to the Disney characters, um, and let's let food just be food, um, rather than really identifying like good and bad, black and white, healthy, unhealthy, and providing labels for it. Um, the other way you can also look at it is, especially with the spiritual connection, like only God can judge me. Like, food that is good, like food cannot judge my worth. Like if I eat a bad food, I'm not a bad person. The only connection that I might have is with, with, with God. And that's the only person who can, who can judge, um, judge my worth, not my food habits or my food choices, I should say. So let's talk about the first one. Let's jump in. And as I kind of mentioned with diet culture, let's start to reject that diet mentality. Um, let's get rid of our, the diet books, the scales, the fact that we feel like we have to constantly lose weight in order to be worthy of buying a new outfit or getting that dream car or whatever it might be. Um, you know, diets really create a distrust within our bodies. Like I said, we're born as intuitive eaters. And when, when we start to diet, um, our body is so afraid that we're going to starve it. And it's going to hold on to food much more quicker than just allowing food to be food and be able to be processed through us and, and carry on. Um, so it really can, you know, put a, create a barrier with, within ourselves. And so how many of you guys probably have seen, let me move this a little bit, um, like that kind of that cycle. So there's this desire to be like, you know what, I'm going to lose weight, I want to be thin, and then my life will be happy and I can start. So we get on a diet. And we go to a birthday party, 4th of July is coming up, and there's hamburgers, hot dogs, cake, 
And we feel like, nope, I can't have that because it's not something that's allowed or permissible on my diet. It's bad food, but I really want it. You start smelling it. You see your kids or your partner and everybody is eating it except you. And so your cravings start to increase. And maybe there's a time that maybe at the barbecue or afterwards, you finally get the chance to have that burger that you've been so craving. And instead of having maybe one burger and listening to your hunger and fullness, we have a couple more and we feel so full and then it becomes uncomfortable. And then we say, darn it, you know what? I got off the diet. Now I've gained the weight that I've lost. And so, you know what, I'm going to get back on it tomorrow and I'm going to, you know, do better. Um, but that really doesn't help. It just creates this really vicious cycle of, of striving for things that um, just aren't uh, attainable in the moment. Diets, uh, as we all know, when we go on a diet, oftentimes we regain the weight that we have lost, and if not more. And studies have shown that it is much more, it is healthier and safer to stay at a stable weight, even if we are um, fat, than to lose weight and gain weight and lose weight. So that weight cycling is extremely dangerous. That is more dangerous than the food itself. Um, you know, I am Lebanese and I grew up uh, with wonderful like food and aromas and um, culture. And when I think of those memories, it's such a positive and uh, positive thing. It connects me to who I am today. And to think of it in a sense that food can be such an enemy really is a, it's really sad to me. Um, and that's why I'm a dietitian because I wanna help people not be sad about the food choices that they, that they make. Um, so, Let's talk a little bit about maybe this myth. Um, I shouldn't eat after 6 p.m. or 7 p.m. or whatever time that society and diet culture has arbitrarily told us that this is a good time for us to stop. Um, what I find so fascinating, I just want to be like, on what world do we live in that our bodies can decide to clock out at 6 p.m. and be like, oh, 6 p.m., I'm not going to break down any more of your food. It is all going to go to fat, and that's it. I'm out. So it's not, that is not um, the way that our bodies work. I think some, maybe if you've ever seen that meme of like, ain't nobody got time for that. That's how I feel like your body is. It doesn't have time to be like, oh, I have to stop at six o'clock. Oh, she ate a cookie. I'm going to hold on to this in her thighs. Oh, she had pizza. Mm, let's, let's put those in her calves. Um, our bodies don't work like that. A carb is a carb is a carb. And um it makes no different what it is. And, and for those of you who are maybe thinking, but Malak isn't having too much of it, I will get to that. I know all the thoughts that maybe you guys have been, maybe are, maybe are thinking, I don't know, we'll see. But so what is it that I, you know, what is that next step? So once we've kind of identified where diet culture can come in and how it can be sneaky and try to convince us that we need the latest pills or cream or weight loss surgery or whatever it may be, um, you know, once it's kind of brought us in, once we identify, I think that's helpful. The next step is, well, how do I identify what my hunger and my fullness cues are? So it's really important to, because this is what helps us regulate what, how much food we want and what foods that we want. And if we truly just asked ourselves, am I hungry? What am I hungry for? And allowed ourselves to have that food rather than stressing over it, our relationship with food can, can really rebuild and be such a positive experience. I love scaling. Um, I think scaling is really helpful because I feel like oftentimes we're just like, oh my gosh, today was a terrible day or I had a terrible body image or I was starving all day or I was so full all day. And it was like, well, hold on a second. Let's look at some data. Let's, let's pull back a little bit and see really what's going on. So on a scale of one to 10, how hungry or how full are we? So if we're feeling maybe like a um, one, um, one or a two, that means like we've maybe passed that point of, we missed maybe some of those hunger cues and now we're starting to feel hangry. And so our mood is starting to shift and change. Um, and we're really, uh, maybe we're getting a little bit dizzy, irritable, um, things like that are starting to happen. And so typically what I say is like, when sometimes somebody will be like, okay, well, what, you know, where should I come into a meal? 
I like to say usually we might come into a meal about a three or a four. Um, so we're ready. It's about 12 o'clock, one o'clock, you know, it's time to eat lunch. Um, my stomach is, is rumbling. I'm, t you know, kind of feeling a little, you know, I I'm starting to feel those cues. And then, um, and the reason, so in the book uh, and the principles, these are separated hunger and fullness, but for the sake of that, I mean, I feel like they go together um, so well, I've put them together. So, um, and with our fullness, we kind of want to leave a meal feeling maybe a seven or an eight. Um, so we're full, maybe we had a couple bites too many, but we're okay, we can still carry on with the day. The phrase I love the most in intuitive eating is for the most part. For the most part, I am an intuitive eater. And when I go home back to Michigan and my little Sutu, my grandma, is making me the most delicious Lebanese food, I am not an intuitive eater. I eat like I'm not going to have her food again, especially being here in Texas. We are a little, we are separated. And so I'm not an intuitive eater. And that is okay because I don't want that pressure to be that I have to be perfect all the time. Nobody is perfect. And having that standard is just so unattainable that we'll recreate that cycle of, of shame and guilt if we haven't performed on our diet. So for the most part, I am an intuitive eater. I'm not always an intuitive eater and that's okay. Um, it's not about perfection, it's progress. So, um, so we'll do the other thing that, um, you know, just something for us to be aware of when we are constantly dieting or restricting or binging, our bodies view that as, as a, as, an, as a traumatic experience. And so chronic food deprivation can make our relationship with food a lot more challenging. And those cues can become really skewed when, um, when we've been constantly depriving ourselves of those foods. The other thing that could be helpful here is if you guys are like, well, Malak, I don't know my hunger and fullness cues. Like that's what I feel like I hear that often because we've been so out of touch. Um, so one of the things that could be really helpful is doing a little, uh, like a, a meditation and she talks about this. Uh, this is not by all means, I'm not crediting. This was not my idea. This was in the book. And so, uh, but it is so awesome. And I think it can be really helpful. So what you guys can do to start to kind of identify what it feels like to be in our bodies is we can close our eyes. And as we're sitting on the chair, put our hands on our lap. And we can feel our pulse, right, by using our hands on our neck or on our wrist. Um, but what I want you to do is close your eyes and try to connect to your heartbeat without physically feeling it. And so if we just place our hands and try to count our heartbeats, it's a good way of, of rebuilding that connection within our body. You can try to do it in the morning or at night, 30 seconds or a minute. It doesn't have to be a, a long time but it does help to, again, rebuild that trust and that relationship with our bodies. Um, let me see, I think, yeah. This is also another way to, to help. So this is a beautiful chart um, of honoring our hunger um, and feeling our fullness. So we have body cues and body states. This is a really helpful, and I think Mimi, we're giving the PowerPoint slides or they'll have access to it. Yes, once this is done, this is being recorded right now. So yes, once you get completely done with it, it we will have access to it later. Beautiful, awesome. So you guys can definitely use this. You can print it out or just even take a mental note of it. Um, and so what you can do is, or what we would, what we do is identify when we feel thirsty, when we feel hungry, when we feel full, when we're tired, when, and where we feel it specifically in our body. Again, we have to redevelop that relationship and that trust. Because if I can trust my body, then I know that it'll help me tell me when to eat and what to eat, how much and when to stop. And then identify, is it feel good? Does it not feel good? Is it an okay feeling? You know, there is no Guinness World Book of records for like holding your pee. So why do we hold our hunger or why do we not acknowledge our fullness? I have no idea. Um, right. So there isn't, it's not necessarily, um, yeah, like a race or a competition. The other thing, the reason why we have the body states is sometimes the body, like when we're feeling stressed, it can look very similar to feeling hungry or to feeling that fullness. So it's helpful. So in that moment, if I'm starting to feel, let's say, 
like my thirst. Uh, I'll feel it in my mouth. Maybe I'm starting to get a headache. My eyes might feel like tensing up. It's going to, I'm going to have a dry throat. And so that's where I would feel it. Um, if I'm stressed, I'm going to also feel it in my throat, maybe in my chest and in my stomach. And again, identifying them is helpful to, to reconnect. In the moment, let's say if you're not, if you don't have the handout, even just taking a minute just to be aware of this chart, it's really helpful because it gives us that second to connect again with what is going on. So it's, I love this chart. It's really, really helpful. Um, and it's just a nice way to kind of break it down. So let's talk a little bit about avoiding carbohydrates because they're bad for you. I don't know what carbs ever did to anybody. I mean, or what protein or fat or any of those macronutrients did anybody for it to get such a bad rep. I love carbs. Um, who doesn't love carbs? We need carbs. Um, so let's talk a little bit about how we can make peace with food, how we can make peace with those maybe macronutrients that we've been like, no, get away. But so how we do that is, um, by giving ourselves unconditional permission to eat the foods um, that we want and also kind of being aware of maybe the burnout that we might feel with with some of those foods so when we start to deprive ourselves we start to feel really good and then the guilt goes down but when we eat the foods that we weren't supposed to on the diet our guilt goes up and the deprivation goes down and so you're constantly in this aspect of like well where do i like how do i fit it like where does it fit in and what do I do, you know? Um, and that's where that backlash comes, comes in. So if I give myself the permission to eat those foods, then it won't feel like a taboo or wrong or shameful to, to experience, experience these foods and these, and these moments. Um, we can, so along with the intuitive eating um, principles, you might, how many, I don't know if anybody has heard of like the all foods fit philosophy. Um, so we really kind of want to move away from that aspect of, again, labeling foods um, and kind of understanding maybe what some of the fears might be. You know, I have a lot of clients that will say like, my fear is that, you know, I've restricted for so long that if I give myself the permission to eat those foods that I won't stop eating. That's why it's helpful to identify those hunger and fullness cues first and to do a little bit of that work there before maybe jumping into this principle. So uh, I'm gonna break it down for, for you guys. Um, this is how I would like start to challenge maybe the thoughts um, and, and to talk about it. So I always feel like I was here, black pizza is terrible. Pizza is bad. It's gonna. It's just not. It's just not good for me. I shouldn't eat it. And I find that to be the most insulting thing because my favorite breakfast is cold pizza and coffee, and it is the most delicious thing. And I'm like, have you guys ever heard maybe of like the saying, "Don't yuck my yum." This is my yum. <laughs> this is me to enjoy. Please leave your opinions out out of my food. And when you really look at look at pizza, what I see is this awesome nutrient dense great food. So let's talk about it. On the bottom, right, there's the crust. Um, and the crust, the carb, and carbs help fuel our body. It is the number one source of energy. Um, carbs get broken down to glucose, and we need that to function. Our brain needs glucose to function. Um, without it, again, we might feel tired. We have maybe memory fog. There might be physical symptoms that we may have. Um, and, and that, so the, the need is there for carbs, carbs also, and typically in bread, you're going to have vit uh, vitamin B <laughs> and vitamin B also gives us energy. It helps, um, with fuel, it helps with our nerve endings, um, and communicating from our brain to, to different parts of our bodies. So what I'm hearing is that so far, it's going to give me the energy that I need to get through my day, to walk my dog, to clean my house, to um, meet with my clients. So I'm so far, I'm hearing that's okay. It's not 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 too bad. And um, then I say, all right, let's let's break it down a little bit more. What comes next? The sauce. 
the sauce is tomato and it has lycopene, which is an antioxidant. It's a superfood. So I'm really confused as to why we never hear food, pizza as being labeled as a superfood because it has an awesome antioxidant um, in it, um, which can help prevent uh, antioxidants are um, basically kind of like cell fighters. They go in and, and remove those toxins um, and they are found mostly in our, in our foods. Tomatoes also have vitamin C, which helps build our immune system, helps with our gums and our teeth, wound healing. And especially right now with the pandemic going on, we all need all the immunity that we can kind of get. So vitamin C in the sauces is, is a great place for us to get it. And then the last part is the cheese. Well, the cheese has, has quite a few different um, things like proteins, fats, and calcium, vitamin D. Um, Protein helps build and repair our muscles. Each day, our red blood cells die and they need protein to help rebuild it. And so even with the basic movement, our muscles are constantly pulling apart and protein helps bring them back together. Um, fat also helps protect our organs. It is also what our, it is our number one source of energy, or one of the number one sources of energy for our brain as well. Our brain is primarily made up of fat. Um, if we are restricting fat, then we, um, then our brain starts to, starts, isn't able to function as well as it can. It also helps with hormone production. It helps with our joints. Um, it helps transport vitamin A, D, E, and K. And so again, the list just goes on and on about how amazing this, this macronutrient is and the confusion around how did this get to be such a bad food? Calcium. Uh, is needed for our bones and our teeth. Vitamin D is also in the cheese because it's dairy and it helps provide, um, uh, it also is needed for heart and nerve function as well. So all I see is these awesome characteristics. Again, if we can kind of just look at food just for like that, I think sometimes it's a little bit easier to um, maybe be able to have and, and, and not feel so guilty for it. Now, yes, if you have an entire maybe box of pizza or you have pizza every single day, sure, yes, there is, I'm not, that is not what I'm saying. But what I'm just saying, when we look at just the food in itself, just that pizza slice, allowing us to see it just for that rather for, than for other things. Um, let me see, all right. So, how can we start to make peace with food? We can make a list of foods that we have tried, see if we like to have, if they taste good, um, do we enjoy them? Um, and uh, let me, sorry. So, so yeah, so what I would start to do is make a list of the maybe foods that we've forbidden ourselves from having um, and write them down to see if when I try it, do I like it? Have my taste buds maybe changed? Um, it takes quite a bit of times for us to try a new food before our taste buds can identify if we like it or not. So, and also our taste buds are constantly changing, just like our hair falls out, our nails grow out. So does, um, so do our taste buds. So the foods we may have liked when we were younger, we may um, not like as we get older and, and vice versa. So it's always important to, to try those, those foods and see if we, we like them or not. Um, and to also make sure that we have the food provided in our kitchen. So again, it's not feeling like, okay, I'm not gonna allow, I'm not gonna bring Oreos maybe into the house because I can't control it. But then when we go to maybe our friend's house, or somewhere else, it feels like that sense, uh, it becomes so overwhelming that we need to have them. And again, instead of maybe having one or two or four or five, however many, we're, we're overeating it because we haven't given ourselves the permission to have those foods. Okay, so, um, so we will, Oh, I'm sorry, I just saw the chat. Yes, pizza is a nutrient dense food. Yes, <laughs> uh, eggs are bad for you. Um, I feel like this was, you know, I, I think the, where the myth kind of came from or the trend came from was that eggs can 
uh, increased cholesterol, they're not healthy, they're not, you shouldn't have them. And one thing I want to uh, identify is our bodies make cholesterol. So our bodies naturally do that. Yes, there is cholesterol found in foods and yes, it can affect our overall cholesterol. But if your cholesterol is fine and you're having eggs, it is absolutely okay for you. Um, it is not a wrong or, or bad thing to have. Um, I feel like I'm constant. I feel like with this myth, it's constant. Like it's good. It's bad. It's good. It's bad. It's it kind of, this one has always kind of teeter tottered um, between the two. So so let's take a step here and see how maybe, what are ways that we can start to challenge that food police? Does anybody have any like food police in the house? Um, so maybe people go around and be like, nope, you can't have this, you can't do that. This is your body and this is what like, um, just making comments, comments around what we're eating um, and what we're having. The reason why this is helpful uh, to have this to, to be able to challenge the food police is there's different voices that we can kind of use to help um, to help us in those situations. So you guys will see there's the nutrition ally, there's the nurturer, there's a food anthropologist, I should say diet rebel ally and an intuitive eater. And so these are different um, ways that we can kind of help. Like if we see that, if we see a food that we may think isn't good for us or is it needed? How can we use these, these ways to reframe our thoughts? So um, let's start with the nutrition ally. So basically, um, is a nutrition ally would be interested in the nutrition and not, not dieting. So maybe ways that we can kind of do this is, um, so in the past with the food police, it may have had us pick foods based upon calories or nutrition. Whereas now as a nutrition ally, I'm looking at it as like, how is it, how is, how is what I'm choosing overall nutritionally appropriate for my health? So we're not dieting, we're aligning with, with our nutrition values, which I'll talk about a little bit at the end as well. Um, and then we'll go to the nurturer. So the nurturer, I always think of it as like my mom. She's always, she's calm, she's soothing, she is, um, she wants to take care of me. And so the way that I would maybe challenge the thoughts would be giving myself some reassuring statements, like, it's okay, I'm allowed to have that food. It might be like, habiti, it's okay, throwing some Arabic words here and there um, to, to kind of help me or again, this would be something I'm doing internally, but helping me kind of see that it's okay to have, to have this food. Um, a food anthropologist voice might be a neutral observer. So simply that this is fact. So just the same way that I kind of broke down that pizza, that's how you can use that voice or challenging those thoughts with like a food anthropologist. I'm just, it is just what it is. It is a carb, a protein, a fat, calcium, vitamin D, that is what pizza is. Um, the uh, diet rebel ally would be um, kind of where we might push or like kind of create those boundaries. I know when I go back and visit that the way that we show love is through food. Eat, eat, eat. Um, I love you, I love you, I love you. Eat, have this, have this. So what we could do would be like drawing those boundaries and being like, please don't push that second portion on me. So you can say that um, to the person um, or saying that even internally, if it feels hard in the beginning. Ultimately, the goal is, is that we get to work to become intuitive eaters that again, we were born with this voice that we were born with these natural abilities and how do we get back to it? The way I kind of think about intuitive eating is like, or even just even in general with all of these principles is my hope is that you guys all know how to ride a bike. Maybe we just, we haven't ridden a bike in a, in a while. And so when we get back on, we might need to put the training wheels back, but then eventually we can take the training wheels off and ride that bike just, just like we were when we were kids. So again, using those different um, voices to help challenge maybe the food police or food rules that we've created. So I do, I always kind of joke around. It's just me and my, my pup here in, in, the, in my place. I always think that if somebody was in um, 
my house and recording, they think I was crazy because I am like the queen of self-talk um, and pumping. And sometimes I'll use each of those voices in the times that I need. When I'm feeling sad or stressed, sometimes I'm going to bring out that nurture voice and say, like, it's okay. Like, you're doing the best that you can. I'm proud of you. Um, and reassuring ourselves in that way. I hope that makes, makes sense. Um, if you guys have questions with it, let me know. Uh, all right, so our next myth is if you're hungry, drink water. <laughs> it's so frustrating. Um, it's so frustrating because if you're hungry, we eat food, not water, right? Um, but it is very common, you know, to, to hear those, the ideas of, of, of using water to fill up um, and like satisfy those hunger cues. But again, all that creates is us wanting more and more and fixating and obsessing over it rather than allowing ourselves just to have, to have those, um, that food or whatever item it may be. So what principle? All right. So discovering the satisfaction factor is, um, is extremely important uh, because it really helps kind of create that eating environment for us. I think it's also important to note when we are emotionally hungry versus physical hunger, emotional hunger might come on like very suddenly, like I am starving, I have to have mac and cheese right now, and I cannot have anything else. And once I eat, I might feel guilty because I ate too much or I ate something that I shouldn't have had because of my the diet rules that I've, you know, we've created. Um, and it's really hard to identify our fullness cues. So again, we're usually eating past that fullness. So we're about at nine or a 10 on the scale. Um, and so things that can be helpful. Oh, and then sorry, let me go into physical hunger. So physical hunger comes on gently, we're going to start to feel it, maybe our stomach, the time. Um, and it, we are able to tell when we are full and we can stop. So, and we're able to wait um, to see if, like, let's say there's a couple of restaurants, we're able to wait to see which restaurant we want to go to maybe, or what food item we want to have, or when we're preparing it. So it's important to identify the two, um, the two different types of hunger, emotional hunger and physical hunger. It is okay to use food to cope with emotions. And I will, I'm jumping a little bit ahead, which I will talk about. Um, but it is okay to use it it becomes worrisome when we are only using food to cope with emotions. So what are ways that we can kind of discover um, the satisfaction factor? So let's look at our eating experience. Um, so sometimes when I'm like working with my clients, I like, well, let's sit down and ask ourselves, what, is, what taste, what texture, um, what temperature do I want? And so things that I would kind of think of is it like, do I want something cold or do I want something hot? Do I want something um, spicy or um, like bland? Do I want something really bright or kind of, uh, I think of a casserole, like bright or casserole. I don't know what that terminology would be in appearance, but I hope you get what I'm saying. <laughs> um, texture, do I want something crunchy? Do I want something soft? Where, like, what is it that I'm wanting? So I encourage you, take a minute, ask yourself, ask yourself those questions to help you identify what your body is wanting. And when you sit, or when you go to eat, sit down. Um, take a second um, for yourself. Bring out maybe the really nice silverware that you only give to your guests. Bring it out for yourself, for your family, because you are worthy of that nice silverware and that nice um, uh, positive eating environment. Savor your food. Take some deep breaths. Really connect with what is, what is going on. And so, right, this is kind of goes back up to the eating styles. So if we can identify maybe if we're a chaotic eater, this would be really helpful in creating that in that environment. So I will say for the most part, um, when I'm having dinner, usually I'll be on my couch watching um, some TV, but at least two to three times a week, I try to sit at the at my kitchen table, the kitchen island, um, and have a meal and just really connect with the food. No phone, no books, no nothing. Um, just really connecting with my body. It's helpful Again, given everything that's going on, everything is really, things are really stressful right now. And so it's really helpful to um, kind of slow things down and connect. 
Again, it's not an always thing, but sometimes if you can do it, it can be really helpful. Um, this is kind of the part also where you might hear of like mindful eating. It's very similar. Another really great activity that we can do at home and practice is maybe get like a chocolate, like a little dove um, chocolate square or some chocolate chips and just put it in our mouths, close our eyes and let it melt and not chew it. And really kind of um, like identify what flavor am I feeling? What, uh, you know, is it soft? Is it creamy? Is it grainy? Um, and really kind of getting to know um, what is it that we really want? So a piece of chocolate is a great way to do that um, and to learn a little bit more about our eating experiences and being mindful. So I told you I jumped ahead, I'm sorry. <laughs> so emotional, okay. So another diet culture myth we might hear is it's not good to emotionally eat. Um, and so let's talk a little bit about this. Um, so the way that we can cope with emotions, um, I always joke around, I'm really grateful that I'm a dietitian. Most of my friends are therapists and most of my friends are always like, you know, come out of things with curiosity and see if, you know, like dig a little bit deeper. I'm like, I don't have time for that. <laughs> I need to know, is it this or is it that? Emotions make me so uncomfortable. <laughs> I've been doing this for a really long time, but I can always feel like when those emotions are starting to come up, right? I like maybe start to sweat, my face turns red, um, and I'm starting to, to feel uncomfortable. And maybe I would go and use food to help cope with, with whatever feeling um, I'm going through. So I just listed some of the basic emotions and feelings that we may help, like that might be helpful to see for us to help um, identify. And then we create kind of our own coping skills. So maybe taking a bath, reading a book, drinking a cup of tea, going on a walk, um, I got my puppy back in February. Well, he's not a puppy. He's a grown dog. Um, but I got him back in February and it's been, I, I mean, God couldn't have sent him in a better time. Um, we're both, you know, uh, staying at home together. But one of my favorite things is sometimes in between is letting him sit on my chest or just even petting him. He's really soft and it helps just kind of connect me back to and, and just ground me. Um, I also have a good, you know, maybe getting a good playlist of when you're feeling uh, stressed or um, needing just, again, a minute to, to ground ourselves. So you guys can create your own little um, own coping skills. Um, if you do follow me on Instagram, I've, there, I, there's a little self-care menu. You guys are more than welcome to, to use some of, um, some of those ideas. Uh, I know personally for myself is when my emotions and my feelings get to that point, it is really hard for me to remember, hey, Malak, you need to use those coping skills to help like bring us back down. And so honestly, I have little coping skill cards all around my house. So I have some when I'm feeling stressed and I literally talk to myself and say, hey, Malak, um, I know things are hard. Why don't you go take a step outside? My favorite song is... Uh, when I'm stressed is Sarah Bareilles is brave. So I listen to that. Um, and I usually make a cup of tea or coffee after to help, um, again, using, using a lot of my senses to help ground me when I'm feeling overwhelmed. Um, when I'm feeling sad, I have different coping skills for that because sometimes those coping skills, sometimes they can overlap and sometimes they need it to be separate. So I love writing things out because I know I'm almost 34 and if you tell me to calm down when I'm upset or angry, I just get, <laughs> so if it's written and it's in front of my face, sometimes it's a little bit easier, honestly, than having somebody to, to tell me to calm down. Don't, it's a bad idea. Don't ever say. <laughs> um, so let's look at this, this next one, um, weighing less would make me healthier. I would have a longer life. My weight is maybe attached to my worth. Um, I think, unfortunately, again, like in our society, we've put this pedestal and we've raised people um, in thinner size or thin bodies. Um, and it's not, uh, it's very self-destructive. And I would encourage you guys to be aware, be aware of the comments that we might make not only to ourselves, but to other people as well. Uh -huh. Like, please do not comment about anybody's weight or anybody's food choices. Like that is, 
that is not up for up for discussion. What I like to say sometimes if you're having like, if you notice maybe somebody has uh, their weight maybe has shifted and you wanted to compliment them. Compliment them on the head up. Wow, your lipstick looks great. Or your shirt is adorable. Your hair looks awesome. Um, things that have no, that are not related to size. Um, that way, because that person is still a good person no matter what size they are, they are at. And when we focus on their weight loss or what, you know, it, it kind of devalues their worth. Um, so I really, really encourage you, please stay away from comments about weight loss um, or making comments about somebody who has lost weight. It's also, we also don't know what they're going through. I mean, they could be going, they could have an eating disorder. They could be going through cancer. They can be going, there's so many things that can be happening. And us commenting on that weight is reiterating that belief that they may have that my worth is attached to the number on the scale. So what are ways that we can find to respect our body? You know, intuitive eating isn't just about um, our hunger and fullness in the food, but it's also about body image and body respect. When I talked a little bit about the scaling with the hunger and fullness, this is also another area that could be helpful. So maybe instead of, um, so what I would, how I would use body scaling with body image is um, identify what our body, how we're feeling that day on a scale of one to 10, I'm feeling like a 2.75. Maybe tomorrow I'll feel like a four. So it helps us identify that, no, there are some days that are, it is getting better. Not all days are really hard and, um, and negative. So um, yeah, the scaling can be helpful. Use that as a tool and maybe track it. It's helpful to kind of sometimes track it to see, okay, maybe these are the days that I need a little bit more help. Is there more, is there patterns that are happening? What is kind of going on? So so remove the body bashing. Everybody deserves to be fed and treated with respect. Wearing clothes that we feel comfortable with. You know, it's like we're holding on to those jeans that, you know, we fit into high school. And it's kind of infuriating, right? Like we're constantly seeing it. And that's really, it's not helpful. Um, it's not a helpful way to connect, to connect again with our body. Instead of saying that my thighs are so big or I'm, you know, they're so fat, why don't we think about it and my thighs are muscular. Um, my thighs are big because they're muscular because they help me walk up the three flight of stairs that I have to go every day to, to walk my kind dog. Uh, and that is why I'm so grateful for these thighs. Sometimes it's helpful to look at it physiologically rather than necessarily like, like feeling like, gosh, I'm so... Um, beautiful and radiating and, and that, that's that's hard it takes time to maybe work up to that sometimes it's helpful just to kind of look at it in the physiological aspects I'm so grateful for my heart because it allows me to live I'm grateful for my lungs that allow me to breathe um, the fresh air um, when I'm outside and helping that can help retrain our brain to help respect our body um, and actually this is a little assign or uh, activity that you guys can do. So when I think about, you know, I am, I'm a certified body positive um, facilitator. Uh, and my goal with that is, is, is finding body respect, body kindness. Not every day do I feel amazing about my body. Not every day is it like uh, it's a 10 out of 10, but do I respect it? Am I grateful for what it does? Absolutely. Can I still respect my body and not like parts of it? A hundred percent. It's okay to live in that middle part. It doesn't have to be all or nothing. It doesn't have to be, I love my body or I hate my body. We can still respect it and treat it with, with respect and kindness and still maybe be like, gosh, I really, you know, I don't like my nose or my feet or whatever it might be. Um, you know, and the other part I, you know, when we think about body image, um, you know, when we go to DSW or shoe store and there's only a size eight, but we might be a size seven, we're not trying to make our foot larger or smaller. We're, we just go and find a different size or a different shoe and we move on with our day. And so trying to take kind of that same um, aspect with our, with, with, with body image as well, I think can be really helpful. Um, 
And then the other part to when we can look at body image, you know, I'm, I'm a first generation Lebanese um, Muslim American, and I am so grateful for my family and my culture and my traditions that have, have, have gotten me to this point. And when we shame our body and when we critique our body parts, it's also like critiquing our ancestors who have worked so hard to get us to this point. And so, you know, I, when I, I am the spinning image of, of my mom, I look exactly like her. And so I can't imagine when I'm sitting here saying, God, I don't like my, when I'm critiquing my body, that's also critiquing hers because I got my body from her. And so sometimes it can be helpful to connect it in that sense that who we are today is part of our ancestors. And when we shame ourselves, we are also shaming the people that came before us. Um, and there's so much beauty in our ancestors and so much, um, yeah, so much beauty in it that it can be such a, it can be a really powerful thing to um, connect to. So think about it, think about it in that way sometimes. And so we're going to hop on over here to cardio oh, and exercise and push-ups and no. <laughs> uh, so how many of us maybe have heard that we should do like run on an empty stomach or in order to have that cake later on, I have to work out and it takes away the enjoyment of, of movement um, and it makes it feel like it's a required thing rather than something that's enjoyable. Studies show that if we are um, maybe not wanting to work out or we're stressed um, and upset that we have to, to, to engage in some sort of activity, that it's actually worse for our health than not doing anything at all. You probably have sensed the theme here where I say like, you know, um, it's not the food that's terrible for us, it's the stress. Stress is really where it kind of comes, is where, you know, our focus should be. How do we help kind of manage that rather than managing our food and our exercise behaviors? Because that's really not, not helpful. Um, and so how do we, how do we move our body to enjoy it? So let's throw out that aspect of feeling like we need to, it's a militant. It's like a, I have to do it six times a week. I have to do it at 10 AM. And if I don't do it at 10 AM, then the rest of my day is, is going to look different. Um, so let's shift our body to, to, to how it feels. Um, you know, I always kind of say that um, a helpful uh, way to kind of look at it is, um, how do we um, move our, like, how do we find that joy in it? So it might be like going and blowing bubbles. Um, my recent activity that I like to do is counting how much wildlife I can find here in Texas. Um, when I'm going on my walks, you know, there are a lot, there's a lot of lizards and frogs and <laughs> lots of creatures out here. So how do I make it a little bit more enjoyable rather than something that has to be uh, a requirement. Um, and even if like we're feeling like, and there's kind of two extremes, right, with exercise, maybe doing too much or not doing, not moving our body. And so one of the ways that we can kind of start to rebuild that relationship with exercise and movement could even be as simple as every hour or every two hours, I'm going to at least stand up and walk around my, my, my room or my house. Um, this helps us get us, especially now when we're always connected so much through, through technology that we can be sitting for longer periods of time during the day. That is even a simple way of, of moving and taking care of ourselves. Um, and, uh, yeah, to, to connect. And if you're interested, Clarity Fitness has some amazing online, um, uh, classes that you guys can go and check out. Um, it's not very often, honestly, that we find gyms or fitness centers that are um, body positive, body accepting. Um, and so this is really, really, really amazing. Um, so I love that we that you guys offer it. And I strongly encourage if you're working on rebuilding that relationship, it's a great place to kind of start um, and to be able to go at your own pace. The exercise log, you can kind of think of it in the sense of um, maybe kind of listing out all the different kind of different activities that you may do and seeing, hey, is this something that I enjoy? Is this something that I need somebody to, 
to, is it a group activity or is it something that I can kind of do alone? So maybe I would do like kayaking, um, biking and like write those all down. And then as I do them kind of go back and look and see, was this something fun? Was it not? Did I enjoy it? Um, how did I feel afterwards? So, um, okay. So this is our last principle. It is, um, honoring our health um, and how many, maybe we've heard of like the dirty dozen or organic food or um, frozen food isn't as nutri nutritious. Um, there's a lot of kind of myths and questions that we may feel. And so the last principle of, of intuitive eating is honoring your health. And so basically what it kind of, if I can break it down, it would be like taking principles like one through nine or one through eight, um, and then also looking at my external health values. Do I like going to the farmer's market? Do I like eating locally? When the CDC says that lettuce has E. coli, do I not, like, how do I listen? Like, I, I will listen um, to that. And so how do we take those inner, like our inner attunement and those uh, intuitive eating principles along with maybe some of those health values that we um, care, that we care about? Um, as a society, we are professional food warriors, and it is really time for us to change, change that mentality, because uh, how we should eat or how we eat is both physically and um, physically and uh, physically helpful, and it can be satisfying physiologically as well. So, how do we create a more satisfying experience rather than uh, something that uh, feels? like required or I should eat or ha have this versus that. Um, another way that we can kind of think of it as, is like if there are medical pieces that we are like medical conditions that we might have to be aware of, how do I honor those? Um, like, let's say maybe I have diabetes or, um, uh, you know, different things, but how do I still value the foods that I want and eating when I'm hungry and stopping when I'm full, but also recognizing that I have some, there's some health goals as well that I have to keep in alignment. So we're not dieting. It's not about, it's about kind of connecting all pieces and bringing them together. Um, so Um, I think one of my notes I have is making choices based on health and wellness and as well as pleasure so that this is something enjoyable, not something that we feel maybe guilty or ashamed if we don't um, meet those goals or uh, yeah, meet those goals. So I think I'm, I guess I'm wrapping it up. Um, so this is it. This is me. Um, if you're looking for some information more about me, this is here. And then here are some awesome resources. You'll see at the top, it says Haze. Haze is this um, abbreviation for health at every size. So that means that, again, our weight is not attached to our worth um, and that we cannot judge somebody by the way that they look. Um, so I've got some books, podcasts, YouTube videos, Instagram. Um, if you guys have questions, please, please, please feel free to um, reach out um, and connect with me. Um, yeah, I absolutely... This is like my favorite part. <laughs> so, yeah. So, and then I will, and then my Instagram, and if you guys, uh, my Instagram is up there. If you guys, um, if you follow me, I usually am reposting some of the other people that I uh, follow. You know, I think social media can be such, can get a negative rep but it's really something that could be um, positive and uh, it can start to break up our feed. So and I'll bring that back. So at this time, guys, does anybody have any questions? I feel like if you guys could give her a round of applause. <laughs> you can't hear it, Malak, but they are giving her a round of applause for that great presentation. Thanks. So I'll do it for you. Good job. Okay, thank you. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you everyone. So we had people thanking you. So I'm oh. saying thank you. You're amazing as always. I definitely thank want to say that that aligns perfectly with Clarity Fitness. For some of you who have not stopped in yet, 
please come see us. We are here in Decatur, Georgia. Um, Malat gave us a little plug in there, but if you go to the chat, I did put our website in there. We're at clarityfitness.com. You can definitely go ahead on there. We do have personal training that you can sign up for. We have our online classes. So you can definitely, we can put you in our Facebook group right now. Because of COVID, we do understand some people do not want to come inside the gym. Therefore, we do have virtual classes that you guys can go ahead and try out. And if you enjoy them, go ahead. And then there's another tab that you can click that you can join as a member. But if you are in the area, come see us. I am one of the ones you will see at the front desk. Again, my name is Nene, so you will see me at the front desk. I can give you a tour of the facility. You can become a member of one of the only body positive gyms we have here. And if this whole presentation resonated with you, you will love Clarity. That's why we are so happy to have Malak come on here because intuitive eating is so important. We have to eat every day, right guys? Stay alive. And you don't want to have to feel the pressure of what can I eat today? Just because society has made you feel like, again, pizza is bad for you. When we just learned that it is nutrient dense, and it has all the goodness for me to survive, okay? So I can eat it every day. <laughs> but, but seriously, guys, this definitely aligns with us. Um, this is something that I feel like most people put a lot of pressure on themselves about eating. When in fact, if you listen to your body, your body is not going to steer you wrong. So we are talking about balance. We are saying... No, don't eat ice cream every day and don't eat pizza every day, clearly. But listen to your body. If it's telling you to do that, do so. You won't kill any goal you have for yourself. We know people set goals and that's okay. Um, but please listen to what it's telling you because the body is only going to do right. We live one life, one life, guys. And you don't know, ever know when that day is going to come, when we leave this earth. So why not enjoy that pizza, that ice cream, or that apple? It can go either way. There is balance. And so when you come to Clarity Fitness, it's the same way. We don't mind if you come in there with cookies, because guess what? No judgment zone, okay? We don't do that. And if you've never been there, we have a great representation of that. We have a smash stair wall. We don't want to see numbers. We don't want to see measurements. We don't want any of that. <laughs> So, again, I want to put this back on my lap, though. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much for your presentation. That was definitely needed. For those of you who want um, need this reference, this has been recorded, and we will be able to give you access to it. There was a lot of great information in this, and um, it's a lot of things that basically is telling you guys, don't stress over food. Don't let it take over your life. Don't let it pressure you into thinking you have to do what people are doing on Instagram or social media, period. They're only giving you the surface of it. You read someone's caption and they're talking about all the good foods. I'm pretty sure they're not showing you the cake or an ice cream that's sitting next to them or when they went out you know, and had a good time with their friends. They're only going to show you what they feel you should see, which is going to keep their platform high and profitable and so forth. So again, this was great, great information. I'm so happy to have you on here today, Malak. And I hope we can, you know, work with you in the future for yeah. some more presentations that you have for us because you are expert at this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. I, I mean, it, like seriously, that's like, that's a perfect summary of that presentation. <laughs> that's awesome. And you have some more people who just want to thank you. I'm not sure if you saw the chat, but I want to make sure you know that everybody appreciated you and you were very helpful and everybody enjoyed it. So again, guys, if you have any questions, please let us know. This is not the end for us. So if you do have more questions and you just didn't get to ask it here, again, this is what we do. This is our passion. We are every day, all day. So if we, if we can't answer it, we'll hit Malak up for you and she can answer it. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. But guys, if there are no further questions, Thank you for joining our presentation, and we look forward to seeing you guys in the future for more to come. Yay. Thank you guys, and have a great evening. Thank you.